Welcome to Echo Assembly God's online experience. We're so glad that you're joining us today. You know, this is my favorite Sunday. If you're familiar with our church and kind of the rhythm of our Sundays, the first Sunday of every month is Donut Sunday, my favorite Sunday ever. So hopefully, as you're watching today, maybe you've got a muffin or a donut or maybe some toast or my favorite, a blueberry scone. I love blueberry scones. Just grab that, get ready, and treat yourself this morning because it's Donut Sunday at Echo Assembly God. Even at our nine o'clock regathering service, outside under a tent, we had individually packaged muffins and donuts and different things, just as a way to say, King, welcome, it's Donut Sunday at Echo Assembly God. So hopefully that uh, you have that ready to go. Also, next Sunday is the second Sunday of the month. So on the second Sunday of every month, we receive communion together. So make sure for next week, you have your commun communion elements. And if you're gonna be coming together at the nine o'clock service under a tent with us, uh, we'll have communion elements pre-packaged ready to go for you. And so we're just excited about what God's doing here at the church. You know, during this whole time of quarantining and different things, we haven't slowed down. We continue to press forward, continue to help reach people for Jesus Christ, and continue to make disciples for Him. And so thank you for being a part of it. Would you do me a favor? If you're on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel or online platform, do me a favor and simply just say hello be below in the comments. 
let us know where you're watching. If you're in the state of New Jersey, let us know what part of your house you're watching in, or maybe you're at the beach or some other location, or if you're in a different state, let us know what state you're in. We would love just to engage with you. And also, if you're on our YouTube platform, would you do me a favor? Would you just hit the subscribe button? That way you'll be up to date on all the new things that we put out. Also on the Facebook, if you would do me a favor for Facebook, simply just share this video when it's over for somebody else to watch and to be a part of. We're really working hard to reach more people for Jesus Christ. And this online uh, experience gives us an opportunity to reach people who may we may not have a chance to normally reach. So thank you so much for being a part of the church family today. And if you would like to give your tithe and your offering, we have three ways you can do that. You can do it online, you can do it through a text message, or you can simply send a check through the mail. We want to thank you for being so faithful in your tithe and offerings. All the money that you give to the Lord through our church goes to reach more people to bring into his kingdom. And let's take a moment to pray because my wife's going to be sharing today's message in Philippians chapter 3, and I'm so excited for it. And she has some special pictures as well, so make sure you watch the whole way through. So let's pray together. Let's ask God's blessing on today and on our lives. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for this day that we can worship you, live for you, serve you, Lord God. Father, would you draw us closer to you during this time? As we hear your word, as we read your word, as we study your word, increase our faith, increase our trust in you. Lord, we thank you for how you blessed us in the past, and we thank you how you've got greater things for us ahead. Bless each person today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for being here today, and let's enjoy today's word. Today, we are diving into chapter three of Philippians. And uh, Paul wrote the book of Philippians from prison. And it's kind of beneficial for us that he was in prison because he wasn't able to visit the churches. He wrote letters to the churches. And those letters make up most of our New Testament. As we've been going through the book of Philippians, we've learned that we need to advance the gospel. We've talked about humility, the humility of Christ. We've talked about unity and community. And then today, Paul's going to continue on that theme of making Christ the center of everything. And um, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 11, but the main focus of this section of scripture is actually found in verse 8. And so I want to read that first so we kind of understand where Paul's going, and then, um, then we can kind of unpack that together as we look at all these verses verse by verse. So let's read verse eight together. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage so that I could gain Christ. So Paul teaches us a really life-changing principle in this verse, right? He says that nothing compares to knowing Christ. Nothing compares to knowing Christ. Paul says nothing on this earth even equals him. I think it's just natural that we try to find our value and our purpose in the things we do and our titles and our responsibilities. We put value in um, our relationships and all these different earthly things. And Paul says that none of that even compares to Christ. If anything, those things are garbage compared to Christ and that Christ needs to be our main focus. And so we're going to unpack this today and kind of figure out how that applies to our own lives. Um, But let's start back up in verse 1. And we're going to read through this together and kind of break it into chunks and and study it um, verse by verse. I will be reading out of the NLT today. As I was um, studying the scripture and kind of going through it, I just really liked how the NLT was worded. I thought it was just, it kind of had a really, some really good points within it. So we're going to start in verse 1 and start reading that. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. 
Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more." So, you know, right away, chapter three begins and Paul comes back to a common theme that we've seen throughout Philippians and we're gonna continue to see over the next couple chapters. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Everything keeps coming back to this joy in the Lord. And I actually like what Paul says in verse one. He says, I, um, I never get tired of telling you these things and I do it as a safeguard for your faith. If you are safeguarding something, it means you are taking measures to defend it, to protect it, to shield it. If you're safeguarding something, you are securing it from danger. Our dog, Harley, is a master at safeguarding things. I got some pictures of Harley for your viewing pleasure this morning. Um, our dog Harley loves her tennis ball. Uh, this is Harley learning from Becca McCrory how to balance a tennis ball on her nose. She only does it for Becca. And the other picture is on the greatest day of her six years of this on her of on this earth. Uh, our old children's ministry were cleaning out their closet and donated every tennis ball to her. You can see the joy on her face um, in that picture. Harley loves her tennis ball. But Harley also has this fear that one day Mike and I will never come home or something. And she's not worried about food and she's not worried about water. She's worried, will I have access to my tennis ball? So we find tennis balls underneath the sofa. We find them underneath our bed. We find them underneath our deck. She digs holes and buries them throughout the yard. It drives Mike crazy. Um, she will get a new tennis ball. And you know how it's like nice and bright and green? No, she hates that. She's got to get it nice and wet, roll it around in the dirt so that it blends into its surroundings so that you can't see it. She needs to camouflage it. Harley takes measures to safeguard her tennis balls so that one day, if Mike and I don't show up, she's got it. If one day I forget to get her a new tennis ball, she's got access to one. Harley goes over and above so that one day, if something were to happen, she has access to what's most important to her. And Paul's kind of giving us the same kind of principle. We need to safeguard our faith. We need to defend our um, faith. We need to protect our faith. And we need to start doing that now so that one day, if something were to happen, one day something were to attack our faith, we are already surrounded and, and like safeguarded in God's truth that no matter what happens, we're okay. And I love that right away in chapter three, Paul's giving us this really practical thing that we can start to do in our own lives. To safeguard my faith, I need to daily remind myself of God's truth. To safeguard my faith, I need to daily remind myself of God's truth. Paul says he never gets tired of reminding them to rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because it helps to safeguard their faith. And so what spiritual truth do you need to remind yourself of? What spiritual truth do you need to start daily standing on? What spiritual truth do you just need to kind of put on repeat in your mind? And when you do that, when you keep get into that habit, when you get into that principle, what you're doing is you're learning to safeguard your faith so that down the road, no matter what happens, no matter what comes against you, no matter what attacks your faith, you've already built up that spiritual truth inside of you. You've already safeguarded your faith against anything the world can throw at it. Throw at it. Now, Paul doesn't just say this at random. He actually says this for a specific reason. If we continue in verses like two, three, and four, we actually see why he was telling them this. And he says that there were people who were coming in to the church and they were twisting the gospel message. So these people were coming in and they were like, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross for you, but... And they started adding these different things, these different rituals, um, things like circumcision. And they were saying, you have to still do those things in order to be saved. To be in right standing with God, you still need to do all this stuff. And so they were taking the gospel message and taking it off of the focus of Christ and putting it more onto our human effort, onto our works, into, onto the things that we do. And so to combat this, Paul says to them, like, if anyone has reason to have confidence in the flesh, I have more so. And if anything, he says, we don't rely on our human effort. We don't rely on the confidence of the flesh. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. I think that is the perfect point. It comes directly from verse three. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. 
It's not about the things that I do. It's not about the church I attend. It's not about how often I read my Bible or pray. It's not about the fact that my parents are believers. It has nothing to do with my human effort and and the confidence of the flesh. It has everything to do with Christ. I'm not saved by the things that I do. I'm saved because I have faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for me. Now, this is a theme that Paul comes back to several times throughout his letters. Look at these couple verses with me. Galatians 2.16, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. I love that verse. It's, it's not about us. It's not about what we do so that we can't boast in ourselves and our effort and the things we do for God. We can only boast in Christ and what he did on the cross. My salvation only comes from him. Now, to really drive this home with his reader, Paul actually starts to get really personal, and he starts to list his own credentials. He says, if anyone has any cause to boast in the flesh, if anyone can look at their human effort and say, look what I've done, this equals salvation, Paul's like, it would be me. And so in verse 5, he starts to list from a human viewpoint all the things that he has the right to brag about. If salvation was tied to our works, He's done them all. So let's read this together, starting again in verse five. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I am so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault." So Paul pretty much is telling us he was faultless when it came to the Old Testament law, right? Paul had every advantage, every credential. He had every title needed. He wasn't an uneducated fisherman like Peter. He wasn't a tax collector like Matthew. Paul had every advantage to be a standout Israelite. If Paul had continued on that path and he hadn't found Christ, Paul would probably have been one of the top leaders within the Israelite community at that time. But he says all of these things... They're his human effort. They don't actually mean anything. And so I want to take a moment real quick, and I want to break down what he's talking about here. Like, what are these things that he's saying? And I want to break them into two categories. We have the things that Paul inherited, and we have the things that Paul chose. And so in the things that Paul inherited, these are the things that um, he was born into or his parents chose for him. He really had no control over these things. He, was, he says he was circumcised on the eighth day. The Moses law said that um, a, a, young, a boy at that time had to be circumcised on his eighth day after being born. Now, other people would convert to Judaism later. Some of them didn't follow the laws that strict. They were maybe circumcised later in life. Paul says, I was circumcised according to the law when I was supposed to. Paul says he was a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, meaning both his parents were Israelites. He says he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Kind of a good tribe to be a part of, honestly. If you track the Benjamin tribe through the Old Testament, they were usually on the right side of history, so it's a good tribe to be a part of. And he says that he was a Hebrew. A Hebrew, that means that Paul was brought up as a strict Jew. That means he would have observed all the customs, all the laws. He would have known the Hebrew language. He would have studied the Old Testament in the Hebrew language as well. Again, not something everybody could have done at that time. A lot of Jews didn't even speak Hebrew. They only spoke Greek. So Paul's kind of showing us he's like over and above. If it comes to human effort and it comes to credentials and it comes to titles, if it comes to all of that stuff, he kind of stands out. If we were to look at this list in today's terms, Paul came from the right family. He was from the right part of town. He went to the right prep schools. He was set up to succeed. Now, Paul could have stopped there, but he didn't. He took these advantages. He took these things that he inherited, these decisions his parents maybe have made for him, and he took them a step further. And then there was the things that Paul chose. So Paul chose to be a Pharisee. A Pharisee was the strictest group within the Jewish community. They not only followed the law, but they created more laws so that they wouldn't break the original laws. They went over and above. And so he was a Pharisee. He says he was zealous in his persecution. 
when this crazy group of people called Christians started to rise up and started to gain followers, Paul was the first to start to persecute them, even to the point of death, because what they were saying was going against their, their laws, their beliefs, their customs. They were, they were talking about all of this stuff and claiming that Jesus was the Son of Man. And Paul was like, none of this matches what I've been taught. And so he zealously persecuted them to the point of death. And finally, he says he was without fault in regards to the law. Now, this doesn't mean that Paul was perfect. This does not mean that Paul was sinless, but it means that he followed the law so that if he made a mistake, if he sinned, he followed the law to cleanse himself of that, whatever he had done to the letter. He was faultless. If anyone looked at him and said, you broke the law, Paul would be able to say, no, I didn't. He was faultless. He was he had it all, right? Like in today's world, if we were looking at this, Paul went to the right college, he joined the right fraternity, he landed the right job, and he got the right promotion, right? Like Paul had it all. If our salvation is based on human effort, on the things we do, and how righteous we act, Paul did it. He had it all set up. But the thing is, I think it's really easy to tie our salvation into these things, right? It's easy to tie our salvation into the things we do. But Paul says over and over again, it's not about the things we do. He actually addresses this in another letter to um, a young man who was a pastor at a church named Titus. And in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, Paul says this, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. If our salvation was based on human effort, or we were to compare ourselves to other people, Paul would be the one we would be looking at. And, but Paul says it's not about the things we do, but it's about Christ. It's about his mercy. And it's about what he bore for us on that cross. And so Paul begins to expand on this in the next section that we're going to read. And picking up in verse 7, Paul starts to talk about how all this human effort, all these things that we put confidence in, mean nothing compared to Christ. That all of those things are like rubbish compared to what we gain because of Christ. So let's pick up in verse seven. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is, is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with him, himself, depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. A lot of great, powerful things are happening in this, in this section of scripture. So let's talk about them really quick. You know, the things that Paul had built his life on, where he put his focus uh, on his works and all these things that he did done before Christ. He's saying at one po point, those things had value. And at one point he put effort into those things. But now when he realized who Christ was, all of those things seem like garbage. They seem like some translations will say the word rubbish. And I love I love going back to the original language. I, I got that from my mom. She always told us to go back to the original language. And the interesting thing about this word rubbish or garbage, depending on what translation you're um, looking at, I'm going to have it up on the screen. This particular Greek word is kind of interesting. And I think Paul's very intentional about using this word because it's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. This is the only time in the entire New Testament that this word is used. And other times that it was used outside of, um, like outside of the Bible and other types of manuscripts and scripts, it was used to refer to excrement, food gone bad, scraps left over from a meal, a half-eaten corpse, lumps of manure, and garbage. We can collectively say, ew, all together at that, because it's kind of like disgusting, right? If you think about it, I actually read one commentary that said, when you find this word in writing outside of the Bible and other Greek writing at that time, it was used by the author in very emotionally charged text. Meaning when the author wished to invoke um, revulsion and disgust in his readers, that's when he would use this word. So just kind of picture what Paul's saying for a moment, right? He's using pretty strong imagery to compare the things we do, our works, the things we put value on in this earth. And he's saying those things are literally like rotting, decaying garbage. It's like, 
excrement. It's like food gone bad. It's like a course being eaten. Like all those things are like kind of invoke revulsion, right? In you, they don't make you picture something nice and fluffy. It's like, ew, I don't want that in my life, right? Like if something is rotting in our household, it's gone. If something is dead and decaying outside, I tell Mike to remove it. Like we don't keep those things around, right? If something is like that, we want it gone as soon as possible. And so Paul's telling us like our human effort, the things that we put confidence in, when we try to tie our salvation to the things we do, it's rubbish. It's completely rubbish. And so we need to start realizing that our salvation is not tied to the things we do. It's only tied to what Christ did on the cross for us. It's not about my human effort. It's about what Christ did for me on that cross. And so Paul says that from that human viewpoint, all of that stuff is garbage, but we lose it all. We remove it from our lives and we put our focus on Christ. Why? So that we can gain Christ. So that we can gain Christ. You know, something that I find very interesting, this is just me personally when I read this scripture that stands out to me. Paul doesn't list this, you know, he goes from this list of things that he used to put human effort and value in. He doesn't replace it with a new list, right? He doesn't go from like, you know, I once put my effort and my value and all this stuff into this list of things, but now look what Christ has given me. Look at the blessings in his life. Look at the things that I'm now doing for Christ. Paul doesn't say any of that. Paul goes from saying all of those things are garbage and the only gain is Christ, It's not about the blessings. It's not about the things he does in his life. It's literally just about gaining Christ, knowing Christ. Everything else doesn't even come close. It doesn't even compare. And so how do we do this, right? You know me, I always like to come down to the practical. I always want to talk about like, how do we live this out? And so I want to ask this this question. So how do we gain more of Christ? Paul Paul says all that is rubbish. And and the result of that is I gain more of Christ. So how do we gain Christ? I want to pull three things from this text that we just read. And the three things that we're going to look at very briefly is by being one with him, by having faith in him, and by knowing him. How do we gain more of Christ? by being one with him, by having faith in him, and by knowing him. In the verse 10, where we see this phrase, knowing Christ, I want to know Christ. Paul uses like a really interesting Greek word here, actually. This isn't a know as in head knowledge. This is a know as an experience. I want to know something because I've lived it, I've walked it, I've talked it, I've experienced it. And so he's saying that, you know, to know Christ isn't this head knowledge of Christ. It's not historical knowledge of Christ. It's not just because you've read some scriptures and you've memorized them. It's because you've literally experienced Christ. Christ. And that's how you know him. So how do we do this, right? How do we become one with him? How do we know him? How do we experience Christ? And here's kind of where things get, I I would say, get a little into a gray area for some of us. Because if I want to know Christ and I want to experience Christ, well, then I have to do things, right? Like I need to start to have some action. I need to do some works, which is exactly what Paul was just talking against, right? Like, so how do I not base my salvation on works and yet still do works to know Christ and to experience Christ? And I think as believers, we find ourselves between these kind of two tensions sometimes. And we looked at the scriptures earlier that talked about how our salvation is not based on our human effort, right? They're not based on the things we do or our works. But then if we're going through the New Testament, we come across scriptures like this. And I got three that I'm going to share with you really quick. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And finally, James 2, 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So I'm not saved by my works. If anything, those works are rubbish and garbage, right? According to Paul. But scripture's also telling me to do good works. Scripture's also saying, and especially in the James verse, right? Like my faith is dead apart from work. So how do these two things work together? How do these two tensions kind of work together, right? So to wrap my brain around this, this is kind of how I understand this, and this is kind of how it works for me. I view the image of marriage, 
I, um, I married Mike, as many of you know. Um, it's, it was the greatest day of his life, honestly. So he's, it's only gotten better there <laughs> since then from him. But um, in my one moment of my entire life, I had one moment of Pinterest craftiness. I'm not a Pinterest craftiest person at all. Um, so I found this picture. I'm going to put the first one up found this picture, this was taken at our wedding, and I loved it so much that when we were renovating a house, I found these old window frames, and I decided to make them into pictures. And so I had this picture printed out, and I had it hanging above my bed, and I was like, it looks so good. And so I decided to do the same thing for Pastor Mike, and I decided to put one on his. And so I chose, well, one of us, there's a debate on who chose this picture, but the next picture I chose for his side of the bed is this one. And we're gonna zoom in so you can really get the full effect of this. Yes, that is Mike with his, his, I don't know, scary face on, right? So this picture actually hangs above Mike's side of the bed and the other one hangs above my side. And I think it just perfectly captures our relationship in one, in one view, <laughs> the good and the bad, right? And so, you know, when I think about these two tensions working together, I do, I think about marriage. Because when I married Mike, it did change everything. That ceremony was kind of the foundation, the turning point in my life. From that point on, everything in my life became built on what happened and what we committed to at that ceremony, right? It changed everything. And from that point on, everything became built on what we committed to there. The thing is, though, I could have left our marriage ceremony and decided never to talk to him again. I could have left and decided to go live somewhere else and do my own thing. The thing is, we would still be married, right? That foundation is still there, but I'm not doing anything to build on that relationship. I'm not doing anything to grow that relationship. I'm still married, but there's no, there's no life there. The marriage is stagnant. People are looking at him and they're looking at me and they're seeing two individuals doing their own thing. But if I want my marriage to grow, if I want my marriage to be strong, I need to invest time in it. I need to invest time in getting to know Mike. Um, I need to to invest time in serving him. I need to invest time in getting to to know more about him, to hear what's going on in his life. I need to learn more about his heart. And those things grow. And as I I do those things, my marriage is strengthened. And I, I view it the same way with my relationship with Christ. I could accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that is not based on the things I do. It is completely based on what Christ did for me on that cross. But I can make that commitment that I could walk away. I don't have to do anything to grow that relationship. I don't have to do anything to strengthen that relationship. But if I want to know Christ, if I want to become one with him, if I want my faith to grow in him, then I need to invest in that relationship. And so that's kind of where these works come into play. And I have to remember, I'm not saved by those works, but my relationship is strengthened because of those works. And so I do things like pray and I serve and I worship and I read my Bible and I take time to meditate on scripture and I take time to do all these different things knowing that they don't save me. They're not tied to my salvation, but they are tied to strengthening my relationship with Christ. How do you gain Christ? By praying, by worshiping, by actively doing things to help become one with him, to have faith in him and to know him. To close out this morning, I want to reread those last two verses again from this section, verses 10 and 11. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul wanted to experience Christ in every area of his life, even to the point of knowing him through suffering. He wanted to experience more of the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead and now lives inside you and me. Paul wanted all of Christ, not just the easy parts, not just the fun parts. He wanted every part, even the suffering, if it meant gaining more of Christ, if it meant getting closer to Christ. And, you know, I think this is a pretty intimate portion of scripture that we get from Paul. We get a glimpse at Paul's heart and we get a glimpse at Paul's life. You know, Paul... Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus, and you can read about that in chapter um, Acts, chapter nine. And um, he accepted his Lord and Savior. In that moment, his life took this drastic 180 turn. He went from persecuting the church zealously, as we read earlier in this portion of scripture, to literally being one of the biggest champions for the Christian faith, being the one who helped spread the gospel further than anyone else, who who helped strengthen the churches. He literally had this 180 drastic turn. You know, I find it interesting that from the time that Paul 
accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to here we are in Philippians, him writing this letter. It's about 25 years. It's about 25 years from his conversion to he's in prison writing this letter to the Philippians. And you know something? In that time, Paul never grew tired of knowing Christ more. He never grew tired of experiencing more of Christ. He never grew weary in his pursuit of Christ. Paul was in prison and he had suffered for his faith. He also helped grow churches, disciple people. He had faith to move mountains. He prayed without ceasing. He did all of these things constantly for Christ, but those things never satisfied him. He still wanted more. He still wanted to gain more of Christ. And what I love is if you look at Paul's writings in chronological order, the closer he got to death, the closer he got to the end of his life, the more he just longed to know more of Christ. So my encouragement to you today is to maybe take these two verses this week and just make them your prayer. Pray to know God more and pray to that it's not just the head knowledge, but to experience Christ in everything that you do. May God show you that the things that we build our lives on are rubbish compared to just knowing Christ. My prayer as you go through the scripture this week is that you would ask God to show you the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would feel the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, that you would see that everything is rubbish compared to knowing and experiencing the Holy Spirit. And finally, that no matter what you're going through, the hardships, the suffering, the persecution, that your eyes would be focused on Christ and you would know that Christ is refining you through those things. Those things are bringing you closer to him. And may we be reminded it's not about the things we do, but it's what Christ did on the cross for us. Let's pray. Father, you are good and you are holy and you are true. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son and what he did on the cross for us. Father, I thank you that salvation is not based on our human effort. It's not based on how good we are. It's not based on the good deeds we do or how often we pray or how often we read scripture, but it's simply based on what Christ did on the cross for us. Father, may we remember everything else is rubbish compared to what Christ did on the cross for us. Father, this week, may we know you more. May we have faith in you more. May we have experiencing you more. And Father, may we become one with you in all that we do. Father, help us to keep our eyes focused on you and you alone. We pray this in your holy and precious son's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.